He was a salesman from northeastern New South Wales who answered his country's call to serve in one of the precursor units to modern special forces in a time of crisis and ended up paying the ultimate price, but in doing so, saved countless others within the dangerous jungles of New Guinea and the Dutch East Indies. Welcome to I Was Only Doing My Job, an Australian military history podcast. This is the life, service and legacy of Sergeant Leonard George Siffleet, who served as a signalman as part of the Special Reconnaissance Department, as well as the Z and M Special Unit during the Second World War. Leonard George Siffleet was born on the 14th of January, 1916 the second son of Leo Vincent Siffleet and Elizabeth Alma Howard of Gunnedah, New South Wales. Known as Len, he was born five months after his father departed Sydney aboard the troop ship Runic to serve as part of the 13th Australian Infantry Battalion, Australian Imperial Force, during the First World War. When his father returned to Australia in 1919, Len's family would be extended by four younger siblings. He was an active and industrious child and a good sportsman, in particular swimming, where he won two gold medals in the New South Wales Northwest Swimming Championships in Tamworth. Apparently, he was also very adept in craft, as he was known for his knitting ability, as he outfitted the Gunnedah Pipe Band with Highland Hose. In the late 1930s, he moved to Sydney with his older sister, Veronica Pearl Broadbeck, to join the New South Wales Police Force, but was rejected on grounds of poor eyesight. Almost ironically, at the outbreak of the Second World War, Len was called up to serve in the Citizens' Militia in August 1940 in Paddington, inner Sydney, where he was assigned to the 60th Anti-Aircraft Searchlight Company, attached to RAF Station Richmond, a strategically important airbase tasked with defending Sydney proper. He would serve in this capacity for three months before being released. The war had yet to threaten Australia directly, and the militia was still functioning on a part-time basis. He and his sister returned to Gunnedah, to take up the responsibility of raising their younger siblings due to the inherent nature of her, their father's work, and Len supported the family financially as a salesman. On the 1st of November 1941, Len re-enlisted in the Citizens' Military Force, listing his sister Pearl as his next of kin, as his mother Elizabeth passed away suddenly in September. Len was posted to the 1st Division Signals Company in Ingleburn in southwestern New South Wales. Twice he went absent without leave, possibly to see the woman to whom he'd become engaged, Clarice Lane, though this is uncertain. Like so many young people at the time, the uncertainty of war played on their thoughts, and Len was still mindful of his obligations to his younger siblings, and decided to delay their wedding even if Len was sent overseas. In March 1942, Len would be attached to the 111th Anti-Tank Regiment, and on the 15th of August 1942, he was sent to Melbourne Technical College to undertake a specialist signals course. Len volunteered for special operations in September 1942 and was posted to the Inter-Allied Services Department, or ISD, that was formed in March, though he gave little insight on the sudden change of direction in his military career in letters back home. The Inter-Allied Services Department, or ISD, was an Australian military intelligence and special reconnaissance unit that was created at the suggestion of Commander of Allied Land Forces in the Southwest Pacific Area, General Sir Thomas Blamey and was modelled initially on the British Special Operations Executive, SOE, to assist the inter-allied covert operations missions in the South Pacific area behind Japanese lines, primarily on Borneo and the islands of the former Dutch East Indies, in guerrilla warfare missions against Japanese positions, and to gather intelligence in support of local partisan groups. It was organised initially under SOE British Army Officer Lieutenant Colonel G. Edgerton Mott, and comprised of SOE members who had escaped the fall of Singapore. For security reasons, and the fact that Australia had been initially forbidden from forming any unconventional warfare units by London, its existence was only known to the Australian Prime Minister, John Curtin, and the High Command. The ISD would be merged with other organisations from the United States, the Netherlands, Great Britain, and New Zealand operating from within Australia under the coordination of the Allied Intelligence Bureau, or AIB, in July. Though operationally, the unit would be comprised predominantly of Australians, it also included British, Dutch, New Zealand, Timorese and Indonesian members in both military and civilian capacities. The ISD would be disbanded in February 1943, only to be reformed into an independent body known as the Special Operations Australia 
in April. And in May that year, it will be known as the Services Reconnaissance Department, SRD, due to the similarity in the name of its British counterpart. Upon joining the ISD, Len joined Z Special Unit that October and was promoted to Acting Sergeant. On the 2nd of October 1942, he'd be classified as Class 1 fit and was accepted into the 2nd Australian Imperial Force for overseas service before being transferred to Cairns in far north Queensland for further operational training at the Z Experimental Station, a wireless relay station used to support Australian and US troops operating in New Guinea for advanced signalist training. Z Special Unit has gained a lot of mystique to it even when it was formed in June 1942, Though, operationally speaking, it served as an administrative holding unit that supplied, equipped, paid and organised Australian Army personnel to the ISD and later incarnations of the organisation. These operatives were trained in jungle fighting, physical fitness, covert surveillance, weapons training, minor tactics, demolitions, extensive signals, codes and ciphers, first aid and unarmed combat as well as parachute jump training, full boat and rubber boat operations, and ship and aircraft recognition. While Len was training, the Dutch subsection of the ISD was planning a mission to establish a coast-watching mission on the hills above the large port town of Hollandia in the northern border region of Dutch New Guinea that has been recently occupied by the Japanese in an operation codenamed Operation Whiting. The town is now known as Jayapura and is one of the most prosperous port cities in, within Indonesia. The team would consist of team leader, 19-year-old Sergeant H.N. Staverman of the Royal Netherlands Navy, Corporal D.J. Topman, two Ambonese privates from the Dutch East Indies, H. Patawal and M. Raharan, and Len as radio operator. This operation would coincide with another operation, codenamed Locust, that would focus on identical objectives within the Australian territory of New Guinea around Atepe. Due to the nature of their pre-deployment training, in Christmas 1942, found Len in Port Moresby, and it was here that he wrote his last letter home to his sister Pearl. I hope you and the boys are well. I would like to see them, and probably by the time I get back they will have grown to manhood. There is no doubt that they would have brightened up the place at Christmas. It would be grand if we could bring back one of those Christmases we used to have at home. Perhaps as the years go on, we may have that pleasure again. In February 1943, both teams were flown to Benabena, the furthest they could travel by plane without attracting attention from the Japanese into a stretch of valley that extends to the northeast of Papua to the east of Goroka town near the Madang province, and they began their long trek through thick jungle and mountainous terrain to Hollandia on the Dutch New Guinea coast. On the 7th of May 1943, Len's rank of sergeant was made substantive, and he was automatically assigned to the newly raised M Special Unit the same day. Though by then he and his party were already trekking along New Guinea's mountainous spine en route to the north coast, and due to strict radio discipline they are operating under, it is unlikely that he would have learned of this information. M Special Unit was formed out of the reorganization of the AIB and encompassed the largely successful Coast Watcher program, with the role of the unit focused upon the administration, support and supply of army personnel tasked with gathering intelligence on Japanese shipping and troop movements and reporting that information back to Australia, by placing small groups of military personnel, civilians, indigenous workers, European plantation owners, on remote islands in the South Pacific to supplement the technical limitations of radar in use at the time. This differed from Z Special Unit members in that these operations were strictly covert compared to the flashier, direct action commando star raids attributed to members of Z Special. Both units, however, suffered heavily under the Japanese, for if they were caught, they both were routinely treated as spies and executed, even if they wore military uniforms which should have afforded them the protections as prisoners of war under the Geneva Convention. Both operations reached Lumni Airstrip on the 14th of June 1943, having travelled over 500 miles by foot and 230 miles by boat. On the 9th of July, the Whiting Party separated from Locust and headed off towards Hollandia with 66 native carriers. Now, Lumi to Hollandia is approximately 169.3 kilometers, or 105.2 miles, as the crow flies. But that trek is over nothing but steep mountains and valleys through dense jungle. Even in 2022, there is nothing connecting these two locations, and very few roads exist anywhere near the path the team would have taken. 
Though the team would get to within sight of Hollandia, they would not reach their objective. In mid-1943, the Japanese garrison at Atepe received word from friendly locals that Allied forces had slipped into the mountains around the town and a patrol was dispatched to track them down, but returned empty-handed. A reward was offered to any local who could catch them and bring them in. Despite word reaching Operation Whiting that their mission had been compromised, Staverman decided to press on regardless. What happened next is pieced together from the infrequent radio communications Len sent back to Australia due to the very real concern of being detected, along with interrogations of Japanese prisoners and translated documents after the fact. In September, Len and his comrades had reached the mountains above Atepe, and a month later, Staverman and Patiwal would be ambushed while on a reconnaissance mission near the town of Nemo, south of their objective, and Staverman would, was killed. Patiwal managed to escape back to Warmer, where Len and the others had made camp, and the three remaining men of the patrol decided to escape south and were directed towards an Australian SRD base near Wamala Creek, but their presence was betrayed by locals sympathetic to the Japanese, and the bounty was offered for their capture. During the meal break at Wantipi, roughly 26 kilometers from the Lumi airstrip, they were surrounded by about 100 local supporters of the Japanese. Len shot at his attackers, wounding one, and though he briefly broke free of the encirclement, he was soon caught. Len and his comrades were beaten and abused by their captors as they were taken to the Japanese outpost of Malal, not far from Atepe. Here the men were subjected to interrogation. Len was beaten repeatedly and under extreme duress, gave away basic details of his mission, while also providing false details to protect other operations in the area. After two weeks, the prisoners were transferred to Atepe, and documentation of their interrogations was sent to the Japanese headquarters for the region, under the command of Rear Admiral Michioka Kameda, commander of the 2nd Special Naval Base Force and the 8th Naval Development Unit of the Japanese Imperial Navy, based at Wewak, 180 kilometers away. The Admiral then convened a military punishment tribunal at his headquarters with a staff officer and a civilian jurist where it was decided that the three prisoners had been operating as spies and were guilty of war treason, whereupon Rear Admiral Kamada sentenced them to death. The prisoners would not be present during this tribunal. The order would then be relayed somewhat dubiously to Captain Kiyoshia Noto, a senior staff officer based at Atepe, who passed on verbal orders to his subordinate, Chief Petty Officer Tiro Watanabe, who commanded a guard detachment of the 2nd Special Naval Base Force, to kill all prisoners at Atepe. As word spread through the camp of what was to take place, Yasuno Chikao, a civilian member of the Min Seibu, an administrative component of the Japanese Navy, who was in administrative control of the 8th Naval Development Unit at the camp, demanded that, as his unit had captured the prisoners, that they should be the ones to carry out the order. It was also Yasuno that claimed that they should be beheaded, not shot, as was required by the Japanese Naval Regulations, relating to the sentences of military courts. At 3pm the following day, the 24th of October, 1943, Sergeant Leonard Stifleet and Privates H. Patiwal and M. Raharan were led in onto the beach into a pre-dug hole in the sand. Their arms were tied to their bodies, and they were forced to kneel before a group of Japanese and New Guinean onlookers. The men were given cigarettes, blindfolded, and then one after the other they were beheaded. Len was selected first to be executed by Yasuno Chikao personally. Regrettably, Len's death was not swift nor planeless. As it was reported in war crimes investigations undertaken by Allied personnel after the war, it took several attempts to finally complete the task. Riharan would be executed by Yunome Kunio and Patiwal by Mitsuhashi Masayo, both civilians. They were buried in a mass grave in a heap just below the waterline and their bodies were never recovered. Yunome wrote in his diary that night, This afternoon for me was an occasion to be remembered for a lifetime. I myself, with my own Japanese sword, beheaded an enemy soldier prisoner. I really believe I was magnificent. Amongst the Japanese onlookers, there were many who declared their admiration for my skill in making such an excellent stroke. Sergeant Leonard George Siffleet was 27 years old. Sadly, it would not be until 1946 that his family would find out his fate, as they had been informed that he had been declared missing, believed taken prisoner, in December 1943. The final moments of Len's life are captured in one of the most confronting images of the Second World War. His executioner, Yasuno Chikao, instructed an onlooker to photograph the execution, 
and it is believed to be the only surviving depiction of a Western prisoner of war being executed by a Japanese soldier, and had he not done so, it is entirely likely that we would never have positively known what happened to the survivors of the Whiting operation. The photograph was found amongst a collection of photos by American troops after landing at Hollandia in 1944 on the body of a Japanese major and contained additional photos from the execution, including Yonome executing Raharan. When these photos were first discovered, it was not immediately clear who this white soldier was that was being executed, and when it was circulated amongst the troops and published in Life magazine in May of 1945, he was incorrectly presumed to be Flight Lieutenant William Newton VC, a Royal Australian Air Force pilot that had been shot down and was subsequently beheaded, as well as a number of other American and Australian soldiers that had been declared to be missing while in Papua New Guinea. However, their reaction was immediate and severe. Whatever compassion and mercy the Allied soldiers had towards surrendering Japanese dried up with reports of harsh reprisals, including beatings and outright murder of Japanese prisoners at the hands of the Australian and American captors, being reported but otherwise overlooked. These photographs and the subsequent war crimes investigations and trials undertaken by Australian and Dutch forces between 1945 and 1947 resulted in Admiral Kamada, Captain Noto, Chief Petty Officer Watanabe, and Yunome being found guilty of committing war crimes based on the charge that Kamada's military punishment tribunal was not a legal court and the execution order was unlawful as no trial took place and received punishments ranging from execution to lengthy jail sentences. Yasuno Chikau, Len's murderer, was killed during the American landings at Hollandia, and despite going through several hundred pages of war crimes testimony, I have not yet been able to determine Mitsuhashi Mahasayo's fate. The only reference I found was him being removed from a repatriation ship hours before it departed for Japan. As Clarice Lane was not listed as Len's next of kin, she did not receive any official notification of her fiancé's death, and sadly drifted out of touch with the Syphilite family after the war, going on to marry another man. She would not find out about Len's fate until 1989, when his execution photo was displayed on Anzac Day that year during a segment shown on an Australian news program, A Current Affair. Len is commemorated on the Ley Memorial in Ley, Papua New Guinea. The Ley Memorial commemorates 324 officers and men of the Australian Army, the Australian Merchant Navy, the Royal Australian Air Force, and some New Guinea local forces who lost their lives in operations in the area and who have no known grave. A memorial park commemorating Syfleet was also dedicated in Atepe in May 2015 and is also commemorated in his hometown of Ganada. Even though he has no known grave, that has not stopped groups from trying to find his final resting place with the most recent attempt being made in 2018. While he received no recommendations for awards of gallantry during his service, attempts have also been made to have him recognised for that service during the war, and that his sacrifice meant that other men of the SRD would survive and assist in the eventual liberation of New Guinea and the Dutch East Indies. The photo of his execution now sits at the entrance of the Gallery 5 of the Australian War Memorial's Second World War Gallery. In the section devoted to special operations missions and the overarching military actions within New Guinea. It is accompanied by his letter home to Pearl, as well as correspondence to the family from Army Headquarters, along with a photo of Len and Clarice from a much more simpler, happier time. Raymond Sifleet, Len's brother, once said that Len was one of those people whose life shone out of, and it is truly a shame that he never got to have that one more Christmas with his family. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job podcast, a Doc Network production. This episode was written, produced, and audio engineered by me, Ross Manuel, with additional research done by Laurie Favell. I'd really appreciate it, and it would help out the show if you took some time to share this with a friend, or leave a review on Spotify, or Google Podcasts, or iTunes, or anywhere that you listen to podcasts, as it really helps other people find the show. If you want to know more about today's episode with photos, show notes, and transcripts, head to www.thedocnetwork.net and follow the show on IWODMJ on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't worry, there's a link in the show notes. If you want to follow me for history-related hijinks and other nerdery, you can follow me on practically everything at Doc Winters. Once again, thanks for listening and catch you next time. Bye.